Hi everyone, in this video we are going to use a bit of an unconventional method to find an expression for the potential energy of a uniform spherical distribution. Now, we are going to imagine that we're dealing with a distribution of mass and we're trying to find the gravitational potential energy. However, this method works exactly the same way if you have a uniform distribution of charge and you're trying to find the electrostatic potential energy. So in the gravitational case, the only parameters that we need to specify are the total mass of the sphere which is capital M here, and the radius of the sphere, which is capital R. Now the usual method that tends to get used for this kind of problem is that you imagine splitting your spherical distribution into a series of successively larger spherical shells. You find the work done to add each successive shell to the existing mass distribution or charge distribution, and you integrate over all the shells until you've built up a distribution of radius r. And that gets you the correct result, and it's quite nice because uh, of the spherical symmetry, the integral you have to do is just one dimensional. However, an alternative viewpoint that we could take is to note that because gravity and uh, the electrostatic force are pairwise interactions between particles, the total potential energy in a distribution made up of particles is the sum of the interaction energies of every possible uh, pair of particles that the system is made up out of. And so that's how I've posed the question down here. We want to find the gravitational potential energy by considering all of those interactions between every single pair of particles out of which this system is made. So let's translate that idea into a mathematical statement. Let's say the total potential energy is u. We are going to sum over all pairs of particles in the system um, and we just use our standard expression for the interaction energy of two particles minus g times m1 m2 where those are the masses of the two particles divided by what i'm going to call r12 which is just the separation between those two particles when i say particles by the way you can imagine um, that we're talking about individual atoms because each individual atom has a gravitational interaction with each other atom in the system or if you prefer to think of a a truly continuous distribution you can imagine just splitting up this solid sphere into a bunch of small elements and each of those elements is a particle. Now of course we could expand out this sum and there would be a finite but very large um, number of terms. The number of terms in the sum is just equal to the number of possible pairs of particles in our spherical distribution. So what we can do is say that this sum is equal to let's say n pairs, the number of possible pairs of particles. Um, because of the way that the mean or the average is defined, we can just multiply the number of pairs of particles by the average interaction energy. So I'm going to use these angle brackets to indicate the average value, um, the average value of minus gm1 m2 uh, divided by r12. So what can we say about m1 and m2? Well, let's say we are going to split our distribution up into a total of capital N particles or capital N elements. Um, note, by the way, that this n is not the same as the number of pairs. We'll talk about the uh, relationship between those two things later on. Um, but because it's a uniform distribution, if we split it up, then each individual element, so both m1 and m2, is going to have a mass equal to the total mass of the distribution, capital M, divided by the number of particles that we split it up into. So let's combine all this together and see what we've got for the potential energy. So we've still got our uh, n pairs factor. The minus g m1 m2 bit inside the angle brackets is actually a constant, right? Because we've split it up into uh, particles or elements of equal mass. So we can pull that out um, and get minus g capital M squared divided by n squared. But we still have to average over the reciprocal distance 1 over r 1 2. Now the value of this average reciprocal distance term is not at all obvious. In fact, my previous video, which was about half an hour long, was all about how to calculate that. But the conclusion of that video was that the mean reciprocal distance um, is 6 over 5r, where r is the radius of the distribution. So I'm going to just quote that for now. You can go and watch the video if you want to see all the details of where it comes from. Um, but that means our potential energy is minus 6 fifths of g m squared over r, just regrouping the terms a bit, um, and then we've got to multiply by the number of pairs divided by uh, the number of particles squared. Now what can we say about the number of pairs? Let's work out what the number of pairs actually is. So n pairs, well if you've got n elements, n particles, there are n ways 
to choose the first particle in your pair of particles. So we're going to start with n. Uh, you've used up that particle. Now there are n minus 1 other particles that that particle could form a pair with. So we take n, times it by n minus 1. Um, but then we have to remember that the interaction of particle 1 and particle 2 is the same as the interaction of particle 2 and particle 1, right? In other words, the order of the particles doesn't matter. So if we just do this, um, n, n minus 1, we are double counting. We'd be counting each interaction twice. So we have to divide by 2 to account for the fact that the order doesn't matter. Now, if we split up our distribution into a very large number of very small elements, then n minus 1 is very, well, it's pretty much the same as n. Um, and so this tends to n squared over 2 um, as n goes to infinity. And so this n squared is going to cancel with the n squared on the denominator. And the only other change is that we have to divide this 6 fifths by 2 because of this uh, over 2 factor that we had here. And so our final conclusion is that the potential energy uh, GPU is equal to minus 3 fifths of uh, GM squared uh, divided by R. Now this, of course, is the well-known result that you also get using the spherical shell method that I mentioned earlier. But I feel like there's something satisfying about this method um, as well. It feels somehow more fundamental because you're looking at uh, the individual interactions between each um, element of the system. So thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.